Welcome to the Financial Planning for Canadian Business Owners podcast. You will hear about industry insights with award-winning financial planner and entrepreneur, Jason Pereira. Through the interviews with different experts with their stories and advice, you will learn how you can navigate the challenges of being an entrepreneur, plan for success, and make the most of your business and life. And now, your host, Jason Pereira. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I have a friend and colleague, Jason Watt, who recently was part of the sale of his family business. And we thought it would make a great idea to come on podcast to discuss the tales of what it's like to sell a family business and the process and the ups and downs and unexpected turns that may be included in that. So with that, here's my interview with Jason. Jason, thanks for taking the time. Thanks so much for having me on today, Jason. I'm looking forward to it. My pleasure. The Two Jasons podcast. This should be interesting. We should actually just, <laughs> you know, actually brand that and start doing that. So, Jason, tell us a little bit about who it is you are and what it is you do. So, I train financial planners, and I have no, I was never a financial planner myself uh, previously. I was actually in the military before. Came into the family business when I left the army in 2006. Um, started training to the life license qualification program, which is sort of the base program for people to get their life insurance license. Uh, kind of by accident in 2009, I started teaching towards the uh, CFP curriculum and uh, really got into that pretty seriously in about 2011 or 12. We wrote our own uh, curriculum around the CFP in mid-2012 or 13 thereabouts. And uh, sort of while I was doing that, I uh, gradually took on more and more responsibility at the family business, Business Career College, and I became CEO there in something like 2018. And one of, you know, one of the interesting things I, is that, uh, you know, we had a pretty good transition as far as family businesses go. Like there was no friction back and forth about control from the elder generation to the younger generation or any of that kind of stuff. So, and I think that really helped with what follows with the the sale of the business that we're going to talk about today. And even though we didn't have a, like we never sat down and wrote out a plan, we did talk about it a fair bit. So the succession was something that I think happened pretty painlessly. So yes, uh, your your company has been one that I've sent many people to uh, get educated on the CFP in the past. So you do a wonderful job. And it's uh, for those of you you know who want to understand some of the stuff that can be done in advance of this type of uh, conversation, go back and listen to the episode I have with Tom, Tom Deans near the beginning of the podcast uh, series about uh, specifically how to prep and decide when it's time to do that sort of transition. So, okay. So what facilitated the desire to sell? Were you uh, approached about this? Did you basically think it was time as a, as a company? as a family to move on? What, how did it happen? Right. So my folks are at sort of retirement age. They're now both in their late 60s, early 70s. And uh, notably, my father's health care was starting to get a little bit like he was having some issues. And we all worked hard. Uh, still, I work very hard. And I think they sort of work hard in their own ways now, too. But we had to be realistic about their ability to retire. And we'd had some real financial struggles. We, we made some mistakes in the uh, sort of 2006 to 2010 era, um, stuff that honestly should have wiped out the business. But like a lot of family Mm. businesses, we made it work. But it really made it so that there just wasn't enough cash flow, sort of free cash flow in the business to be able to finance their retirement. And I didn't have enough assets to be able to buy them out for an amount that was going to be meaningful for them to retire. So, you know, when it came time to talk about their retirement meaningfully, Mm -hmm. we really had to look at a, a third party acquirer. And we hadn't honestly thought about this is a source of acquisition. It's one of these things where about 2015, 16, we started to get our ducks in a row a little bit. We started to fix cash flow. We had good years. We had uh, positive EBITDA. We had just a lot of the the hallmarks. And we started talking about it internally, about the prospect of sale. And without going out and looking actively for acquirers, we had a couple of people approach us in about 2016, 17, 18. We had some, a couple of US private equity groups. We had our hmm. ultimate acquirer approach us in 2017, the first time around. And we couldn't make anything work then. It just, our financials weren't strong enough to support an acquisition, but it was still, it was good sort of foot in the door, it made it obvious that that there was a conversation to be had there. Also, the due diligence process must have alerted you to issues and deficiencies that you had uh, that you need to get cleaned up prior to any kind of sale. Exactly right. Starting even, and we didn't get into a, a formal due diligence at any point in that first sort of round of, let's say, tire kicking, but you're exactly right in that we knew that some we had to do some more cleanup. And some of that also revolved around, we had a silent partner in the business. We brought on a a sort of financing partner when we were having our financial struggles in the late 2000s. And we were able to get some uh, buy-in from that 
that silent partner with structuring things properly and and just thinking about the future of the business. So yeah, absolutely. Um, we cleaned a bunch of stuff up. We got some old, we had a, a lawsuit that was lingering that we uh, got off the books and and just a bunch of stuff like that, that you're exactly right, that, that we identify it as impediments to sale. So this is not an uncommon story, especially if the business relies on the founding family members to stay in it. So I've seen many cases where over time, the parents kind of retire out of the business and then the cash flows of the business are sufficient to buy them out over time, which, which can work. But if the parents are still deeply entrenched within the business operationally, or the value relative to cash flow is just not something that's going to work out over a reasonable amount of time, then you do have to consider a third party. So it makes sense that, you know, that experience is not uncommon. So talk to me about, you know, you had the initial approach with the private equity firm, but when it came time to actually start selling, did you start marketing your firm? How did, uh, how did that work? No. So honestly, what happened here was kind of a surprise. So we did have these PE firms come to us, but we didn't end up ultimately selling to a PE firm. We sold to a local company actually just by, I don't want to say coincidence, but they had come across us in in their business development. So an e-learning company based in Edmonton, it used to be called Yardstick at the, the original discussion mm-hmm. was with a company called Yardstick, which actually has some, was doing some exam work in the financial planning or financial services space. Um, doesn't mm-hmm. anymore. There was uh, some conflicts of interest there. Just in early 2020, so January of 2020, the first workday of 2020, actually, I had a meeting scheduled with the principal of what had, it was its first day is now We Know Training. So Yardstick mm-hmm. rebranded. They did a little divestiture and We Know Training as an e-learning company was left. And I had a meeting where I thought we were going to talk about a financial educators conference, like having some sort of conference to sort of get all financial ed- educators in Canada together. And mm-hmm. it turned out that it was an overture to look at the acquisition again. So this was January 2020. And we sort of agreed that this is something we wanted to explore. In that very short meeting, we talked price a little bit just to kind of get a feel for you know, whether it would be enough money for us to consider a deal seriously and whether the price would be right for the buyer to make a deal work. Yeah, and I think it's like, this was still the days of low interest rate environment. So we knew that it was a, a finance deal and that was, you know, I think that helped to make the deal work. So really we signed a letter of intent, I wanna say just within a couple of days, a couple of days before the whole COVID lockdown situation happened, we ended up Good going timing. to a letter of intent, yes. So that's that's how it came about. Let's talk about the process in itself. Okay, so the letter of intent is of course the um, the first step once you've actually had these overtures. Typically that's accompanied with or inclusive of a non-disclosure agreement so you can start sharing agreement uh, information. Is that what happened there? Exactly that. Yeah. So there was sort of a a base price established in the letter of intent. And there was an agreement that we wouldn't talk to any other prospective buyers during that time, non-disclosure back and forth. So they're not going to disclose any of the confidential information we released to them about customers or business practices or anything like that. And I have to be even careful in this conversation because there's still stuff around, you know, exact pricing in the non-disclosure agreement that, uh, you know, that I'm not uh, privy to disclose. So yeah, that exactly that. That locks in sort of that we're serious about a deal. And really, my experience with this anyways is that once the letter of intent is signed, there's a fair, like, you wouldn't sign this if you're not seriously intending to proceed. And something we did with our letter of intent was we added a break fee. So we said, look, you know, if you're just going to come and kick the tires, which I didn't think they were going to do, you never know um, that they were going to pay a break fee. And of course, now this break fee thing is in the news with the whole Elon Musk Twitter thing. Oh boy. Yeah. That is going to cop that one up. That shit was funny. Funny side note. First judge who heard this entire thing basically told them to grow up and get the deal done. Not in those words, but it was pretty amusing. So again, and this makes sense, right? So the, the purpose of a break fee is basically that you're you're spending time, right? You're spending time and effort to give these people the financials, to let them look inside the kimono, you do all this other stuff. And you're also taking time and opportunity away from basically looking for any other deals. So there's an opportunity cost and a direct labor cost. Is that about right? 100%. And the effort involved in due diligence was surprising to me. Um, I knew it was going to be busy. I'm a regular listener to John Warlow's uh, Built to Sell podcast. I don't know if you listen or not, but it's excellent. And he talks to a lot of people who recently sold their businesses. They all talk about how much work due diligence is. And still, it was really like having a part-time job for the roughly three months that we were going through that due diligence process. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. And it it totally is, right? Because I mean, the reality is too, is that the stuff that you need 
to sell your business and inform the discussion is not stuff you necessarily have readily accessible. You're too busy operating the firm. So the financials are one thing that that's fine. But then, you know, they're, they're going to want to know things like probably, especially in your kind of business, like what is the re- recurrence of buyers, right? Like how many times do people buy one course and come back again? And, you know, like what other metrics, you know, were, were kind of surprises to you that, that basically came up as part of this? Well, that's a good question. So what metrics do we provide? I mean, we really provided a ton. And I guess the overall here was, you're absolutely right. Oh, it, you know, a big thing was concentration of customers. So, and this wasn't really a surprise, but I didn't necessarily have all the data myself at my fingertips. And one of the challenges is we had a staff member who's responsible for all that, but I couldn't tell him that we're prepping the business for sale, right? This is, we couldn't really mm. go to the staff and say, yeah. um, you know, broadly, we're selling the business because people get concerned about their jobs. They might disclose it to customers. They might disclose it outside of the bounds of the NDA. So that was a tricky thing to manage was pulling all of this information. I guess on the metric side, there was some stuff that surprised me and something you talked about on your podcast before you know you talked about um, the uh, interview with Tom Deans but the other one that you have that's really good for this is your series on financial statements so you know working capital adjustment shareholder loans all of this these were things that I wasn't as prepared to deal with we were pretty good about sort of operational metrics it was the shareholder and kind of cap table metrics that were were harder to get a handle on yeah, and those are actually the ones, I mean, the, the the shareholder loans, those have to be cleared up before any sale, right? No one wants to take over a business and simultaneously also owe money to the to the shareholder, right? So those have to be dealt with one way or another. And that's usually easy for most business owners to understand. The working capital conversation is one that, unfortunately, like I find a lot of business owners have their hard time wrapping their heads around it because they just see it as cash. You know, they see it as inventory, cash, all the stuff that it shows up there. But at the end of the day, and as I said in the podcast, in that podcast, it represents an investment in the company, right? Because, you know, I, I had this conversation with a friend of mine who's looking to sell recently. And basically, you know, he's like, well, I'm going to take all the, I, like, don't I just take all the cash out of the business? I'm like, no, because here's the thing. Like, imagine you own a lumber yard. Oh, sorry, a lumber mill. You're just talking about taking the trees away. So someone bought the mill, but they can't generate the profit without the trees. So now they have to turn around and buy the trees, right? So you're asking someone to pay money for your business and then simultaneously make an investment so just, just for cash, like, or any other form of working capital. To me, if I'm a buyer, I'm going to be like, oh, is that how it's going to be? Great. Well, that cash investment just came off the price, right? Because the working capital is a is as important to the business as any kind of talent, act, talent that they have or any kind of equipment they have, because it's all part of the same kind of factory process to basically make money happen. Yeah. And then the other thing that goes along with that is the repayment of the shareholder loans, because, and this was all very transparent, but I just, I didn't understand it before we did the deal, this sort of difference between the enterprise value and the price that the buyer pays, where we take the shareholder loan accounts all out of the business, and that goes towards the sale price for the business. That was a, uh, it's just something I hadn't understood well before we did the deal. And it worked out all good. I don't want to sound like the buyer was in any way disingenuous. They were they were very, very generous with us and, and really, I think, uh, negotiated. There, there was no retrading or anything like that. It was, the deal was done very well. It's just understanding these mechanics mechanics becomes pretty complicated. It can be. And it makes sense, right? Because I mean, if you're paying out the shareholder loan, you're extracting some form of value in the business, right? So you can't extract value out of the business and then simultaneously ask for that value in the purchase price, right? So there's a book that was written, it was an advisor saw so talking in the US at a previous conference. He actually wrote a book on exit planning called Your Baby's Not, Not Pretty, which is exactly <laughs> like the first thing we always to talk about is I know you think your business is awesome, but if there's an endowment effect here, and if you were you were a third-party buyer, you would find all the warts guaranteed, even though you don't see them. So Okay, so the those were surprised. So let's talk about once due diligence is over, right? And how long how long did due diligence take before they said, okay, we're 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 good to move forward, and this is the price we're willing to pay? About three three and a half months. It was, and it, it was again, it was a well managed process. The buyer had a pro forma, so they sent us this mm. very long Excel spreadsheet with you know tabs for financial, tabs for legal, tabs for HR, tabs for admin, mm. and it was a matter of. Uh, you know, they had a SharePoint site set up where we just fed information back in, or I just fed information back into that SharePoint site. And then there was a sort of second round of questions following that. And then a third round of questions following that. We had a lot of meetings in that time, tons of uh, tons of Teams meetings, just because they were a Teams user. Don't um, get me started on Teams, but good thing you. I know, I know. I, uh, I just, that just press your buttons. And about three and a half months. And then we sort of agreed in principle that we were going to make the deal happen. They liked what they saw in due diligence. There was no surprises there. 
Um, no reason to to change the price. So that was good for us as well. And we knew, I did know the uh, sort of ugly baby thing. Like, I, I like, I've never heard that specific thing before, but I did know that, that there was mm. some, some warts. I knew we had concentration with one customer. Mm. I knew that there was some regulatory risk. So yeah, we, we were, I was pretty aware of that because we had thought about sale meaningfully beforehand. So I went into it, uh, I think, eyes wide open, at least on the, the front of where their risks were in the business and that kind of thing. Fair enough. And clearly you, you dealt with an experienced buyer because, you know, to have all that stuff set up and ready to go and understand the process, inexperienced buyers can also be very difficult because you may have a buyer potentially, but have they ever done this before? Do they understand due diligence is? Do they have a realistic understanding of what valuations are? And the answer to a lot of that is, is quite honestly, no, until you've been down the road or you have experience with it, it's all just hearsay and guessing. So you get to that stage, Due diligence is done. Talk to me about uh, the negotiation of the deal. I know there's NDAs there, but how long did that process take? You know, the the method you know, to negotiate the price, the methodology, the timeline, how that go? So because early on I had expressed what we were looking for, I knew, for example, that if we could do a share sale, that a share sale was going to work out much better for us. Mm-hmm. So I had indicated that early on. I had presented... I because I had done some financial planning work for my folks, sort of retirement planning at least. So I knew what that had to look like. And I had been very forthright with that with our buyer. And I know that's not always the best advice. You know, you sometimes being the first to offer a financial position puts you at a disadvantage, but I knew what we needed. And because I provided that information, I think it helped the buyer to structure the deal well. So, or at least structure the deal in a way that he knew was going to work for us. So Mm -hmm. we were able to do a share sale. And it's ironic because, you know, I teach the uh, lifetime capital gains exemption. And I say, in practice, a lot of times it becomes unavailable. Buyers prefer asset sales. People have too much passive stuff in their corporation. You were just telling me a story a minute ago about a corporation holding a boatload of passive assets, real estate in the case you were describing. So Mm -hmm. the lifetime capital gains exemption, I find you spend all this time teaching it, learning it when you're going through CFP curriculum, and then how many sellers can actually use it. So we were able to use it, which was nice. And it really takes a lot of pressure off in, in other ways. Well, this is one of the things that I refer to as a lever in these uh, these negotiations, right? Like there's different different parts of aspects of the negotiation that can impact the price. Everybody focuses on price, but what about the terms, right? Is it share versus asset? Well, if it's with shares, then it's worth, you know, it's an after-tax larger amount for the for the uh, for the sellers. So, if it's not, then basically that is less like quote-unquote liability for the buyer, but also should command a higher price because there's less liability in your tax benefit. And that goes, you know, in keeping with things like, you know, escrow amounts, uh, how much is kept back for how and for how long, you know, conditional certain performance of, of the business, uh, what interest rates, if any, are charged. You know, these are all things that are that, you know, you negotiate all these other terms on the back end, but really they they impact that the end number, which is what you would, you know, everybody thinks about the price, but the different levers can really have, it can really move them around. And it's, it's interesting. The, uh, the share versus you're right. We talk about this all the time and there's some, some buyers, I mean, most lawyers will tell you just never buy the shares, right? Because they're looking at it from a liability standpoint. My response is always, that's nice. We can indemnify to some degree, right? Depending on the nature of the business, especially yours, like no one's going to turn around and sue you for failure to deliver three years after taking a course, right? Like that's just, let's get realistic. Whereas some, businesses with very long-term contracts, that's a very real concern, right? So it makes sense. Yeah, we don't have a big product liability concern or anything like that. And in fact, yeah. there was a, a sort of pro-buyer reason for the uh, the share sale because there's a bunch of regulatory approvals that go along with Business Career College. So they were you know, certain that they were getting all those regulatory approvals with that uh, share sale. Yeah, And we did have well, I mean, to approach our various regulators around that too. Fair enough. I mean, there are ways to take advantage of the exemption, even if you do an asset sale in particular, if you've yeah. done a crystallization, you can do that. But again, you have to do that well in advance of the sale. So, so yeah, this is, we talk about that a lot. We focus on that a lot. And I, I'd say the other thing to, must have been to your benefit. I mean, I'm sure, did you have to do any sort of purification of the company prior to? And just so everybody knows, purification, there's a test that happens in order to qualify for this lifetime capital gains exemption that says that effectively all of the assets of the business have to be used in operations. You can't have a large rental property in there or a bunch of investments. And the test for that is, correct me if I'm wrong, it's basically 50, uh, you know, at the time of sale, about 90% of the assets have to be employed in the business. And I think it's two years prior, at least 50% have to be. So you need to, you know, I just, I just did a massive purification for a client just, just last month, because if you don't do this and someone comes to approach you for sale, well, then 
it's off the table. It's not even an option. You're exactly right. We didn't have to do it, but I was aware of those rules. Um, I mean, honestly, kind of if we'd had the purification problem, then we probably would have had the assets to do everything internal. Yeah. And I probably would have been buying my folks out you know, with, fair, the, fair with enough. corporate assets. Yeah. Fair enough. Makes sense. So you basically get to the negotiation stage. How long did it take to come to the final contract? So this is where we ran into a little bit of a roadblock. And it was really... Uh, you know, I mentioned that we had this uh, silent partner before. So mm-hmm. what it was, was, and I hope I don't disclose too much here, but I'm going to go anyway. So my folks and I owned 49% of the business and our silent partner owned 49% of the business. And then there was one person who owned the sort of a person that we both agreed on that owned the tiebreaker vote. And the silent partner came to me sort of when this all became obvious. This kind of ties into, it was was not a purification issue, but it was a tax planning issue where He wanted to move some shares around, think so that his partner could take advantage of lifetime capital gains exemption. A little late for that because there's a two year provision, right? They get to be in. Well, anyway, so yeah, fair enough. I think there might have been some rectification there. Mm. So essentially, like jumping in the time machine and redoing some documents. So because we had a unanimous shareholder agreement in place that said you can't transact shares without everybody's agreement. He came to me and said, you know, I need your permission. I need you to sign against the USA and say we can transact shares. I did that under the understanding that there was going to be really just like a tax planning reorg on his side and something that I wasn't anticipating happened there. I don't want to get into tons of detail around it, but it gave the buyer pause. The buyer said, well, hang on a second here. Like we're not now dealing with who we thought we were dealing with as far as the purchase of these shares. And I had to, at this point, really exercise a lot of force of will to make this happen. I Mm. had a couple of really difficult conversations and ultimately we were able to get it to happen, but I think it's a good warning. And it's exactly like you say, Jason, you know, we, that stuff should have been done a couple of years prior. We had talked about a possible sale of the business. Everybody should have had all their tax planning ducks in a row in 2017, the first time that we really looked at selling the business. So, you know, trying to get that tax planning sorted out and bringing in, you know, different parties than originally expected, it it caused some issues. Yeah. As I like to say, when people start saying, you know, and unfortunately, every advisor's had this, they've had the, you know, we try to go to a client, we tell them to get this stuff ready, they put it off, they put it off, they put it off. And then, oh, lo and behold, an unexpected purchase option comes along. And they're like, well, can't we go back and do it? And the answer is, unless you have a DeLorean, you're not going to go back and do it. Well, and and frankly, no buyer, you know, the vast majority of cases, no buyer is going to want to sit around and wait two years for you to get your act together. So, you know, they're looking to buy because they're motivated. So it is what it is. So you ran to a snag there. So snag aside, how long did the process of negotiation and rectif- and coming to that conclusion take? So from the very first conversation, which was January 1st, until the deal closed was July like 15th or 16th, I should know the date, but July 15th or 16th. So call it six and a half months. And I think that's a reasonable time frame. It should have closed a month earlier than that. If we hadn't had that uh, sort of shareholder reorg snag, then it would have been five and a half months. And again, and the other thing with that whole reorganization snag is that then the lawyers had to review documents a second time. And that cost us a Mm. fair bit. My lawyer was great for this, super responsive, super quick, but of course bills you for it, right? He wasn't doing this for free. Absolutely. And, you know, in fairness, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot, it's usually a ton of documentation to do. It's not, it's not just a general, you know, shareholder. It's just not just a sale. You know, there's the guarantees. There's, you know, oftentimes employment contracts for key people who are staying on. So there, there is a lot to be done. They can really get people in a huff over it. I, I would say, you know, the best advice I'll give on this is do not have the lawyers negotiate the sale. The more you can, you know, don't get me wrong. You might run into a snag where there's a negotiation topic where the lawyers have to get on a call. But I have literally had people say, well, you know, I'll just have my lawyers, you know, negotiate this with their lawyers. And my response is, you know, given the size of the sale, what percentage of the sale do you want going to the lawyers? Because at this point, it's going to be pretty significant. The last thing you want is someone charging those kinds of hours to just go over to go over and negotiate a business that they're not intimate with. That's the reality of it. No, yeah. And certainly we didn't do that. We we negotiated. So me and there was an sort of an agent working for the buyer, but he he was he knew what he was doing. And so he and I did the negotiation. And really the lawyer was my lawyer and accountant. And in fact, I dealt with two lawyers here to help make the transaction happen. I'm one on the corporate side. And then I signed an employment contract that I also had reviewed. Mm -hmm. I feel like having a good team, like we had had that employment lawyer, we had the, the corporate lawyer, and we had our accountant, all of whom were people we had 
dealt with previously, all of whom knew our business reasonably well. So that went along. Yeah, this is you know valuable lesson there, especially on the other side, is that hey, you know, you can have there are people who can help you through this that aren't lawyers who are more affordable. There are people who broker these deals or counsel on it. Financial advice, like financial planners and advisors, like myself, who've been through it before. I've, I've coached many people through the process and gotten to the point where you know we get the the broad strokes done and the lawyers come in for the fine strokes and that can that can save, save you a bundle. It also helps. It's also helpful because they tend to speak in non legal ease. But one thing, one piece of advice here, and you kind of said it, and you didn't really uh, accent it, was the. The fact that you were dealing with specialist lawyers, you were dealing with a corporate lawyer, you were dealing with a, 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 a employment lawyer, you were dealing with people who knew what they were doing. And I find that's also one of the big obstacles is when someone uses their generalist lawyer, that goes wrong. I mean, uh, you know, I saw I remember one deal I was involved with the, the lawyer was great at what they did, but it wasn't on M&A. And to the point where a conference call had to be set up between both lawyers and he brought in a third lawyer to argue this point. And the third lawyer ended up arguing with the opposite side, uh, sorry, ended up agreeing with the opposite side's lawyer and disagreeing with him. So like, you know, you think about, you think about the wasted money that was on behalf of the client, because you just, you ask someone, you, you try to fit a square peg into a round hole, right? So that's, that's a challenge. So yes, yeah, so I'd say, Again, I've said this many times before, deal with specialist lawyers and people who've been there and understand this process before. It'll save I, I did ask my lawyer that when we were entering, because I knew the lawyer, like he was our corporate lawyer. He had done you know, our shareholder documents and all that kind of stuff and did our annual returns for years and years. And mm-hmm. I had asked him, I said, am I best to deal with you for mergers and acquisitions? Do you have M&A experience or is there somebody else that you should send me to? Like we we had that conversation point blank. Yeah. I didn't assume that that was something he was qualified in. So. It's also, I mean, I will say this much. This is why I do favor dealing with larger law firms. They may be more expensive on a per hour basis, but the reality is, is just having, being able to, for them, for that lawyer to turn to the tax person for an advanced question or the, or the labor person, like just being able to have that network right in the house is far more valuable than having one person figure it out themselves. Yeah. Now we, we were at a boutique firm, but a boutique firm that really only does corporate. And when it came time for the employment law thing, they didn't have somebody in house, but I knew somebody else that I had previously. Yeah, I think, and, and that was more of a, you know, that's more of a secondary, like separate, like yeah. it doesn't, it impacts it, but it's more so like making sure, you know, you've already agreed at that point to work there for how long and for how much. It's just a matter of making sure everything else is in order. So 100%. excellent. Okay. So, you know, you get the deal in principle, everything's ready to go. Talk to me about closing, <laughs> you know, how much, how long yeah. did take you to sign your life away. <laughs> so that was actually pretty, like once we had everything done, the, the closing was pretty good. Money flowed exactly as it was supposed to. There was no delays around getting cash in hand. I think that the financing uh, partner that our buyer used or the financing team our buyer used was really good on this front. They made sure that you know money was paid when it was supposed to. My purchase was, uh, you know, I took a small amount of cash and then some equity in the buyer my folks took 100% cash and that cash, you know, they took some up front and then some paid monthly over it was three or five years now, but some time frame like that. That's all gone exactly as expected. None of the money there was at risk. So it was all based, it was all a set price, which allows us to use lifetime capital gains exemption for the whole thing, of course, no performance amount or anything like that. The only thing was that there was a, a small holdback, what I thought was a fair amount to make sure that we captured legal fees, waited for that final tax return to be filed, make mm. sure we captured any taxes. And I was actually surprised. I thought that we were never going to see any of that holdback amount. And uh, and we ended up with you know a little bit of cash then too, which was a nice bit of good faith, right? It just felt like getting that yeah. unexpected cash against that whole back amount. Cause I honestly thought it was going to get all eaten up in legal and accounting fees. Yeah. And I will say, you know, like, this is also a, you know, dealing with a good buyer because you know, I've seen deals where that whole back amount, yeah, guess what? Uh, it just doesn't get paid. <laughs> it's like, go challenge me about it. Right. Unfortunately. Right. So again, hopefully that never happens to people and that's a deal in good faith. So, you, you know, deals done. Talk to me about what surprised you along the way that we haven't covered. So what, you know, the textbook version of this, but what <laughs> yeah. about the reality of it kind of was a surprise or new to you? So, and I'm very aware of the, the personal tax planning issues around this. Like I know I talk about lifetime capital gains exemption and the uh, cumulative net investment loss and alternative minimum tax. I talk about all of these things in class regularly. I understand how these work. And yet I was so busy with the acquisition and and I didn't really think about my personal tax planning all that much, except to make sure that I was going to be able to use lifetime capital gains exemption. But when it came time to file my tax return, lo and behold, because I had borrowed some money personally in the early days of the business, 
So I had a cumulative net investment loss, which I knew, like I was aware that I had a cumulative net investment mm-hmm. loss. And what that cumulative net investment loss does is it reduces your ability to use the lifetime capital gains exemption. So it wasn't a big deal, but I had a little capital gain that I had to pay tax on uh, because of my previous use of investment losses related to borrowing money. It's yep. it's a super complicated issue. And I did end up with, again, having to wipe out that senile balance, that cumulative net investment loss balance before I could use my capital gains exemption. So it's funny because I talk about it in class. I just never thought about it for myself. And there it was. So that, and it, that was sort of, and it wasn't a huge thing. It was a few thousand dollars, like not anything material to the sale. And then the other one that, again, caught me a little bit by surprise was alternative minimum tax, which of course is in the news so much now. But because really I had a large capital gain, mostly wiped out by the lifetime capital gains exemption relative to my income in that year, I did end up with some AMT payable. And I had made a big, this is a financial planning one. I had made a big RSP contribution because I had the sale proceeds and I had nothing else to do yeah. with it really. So made a big fat RSP contribution. And my accountant worked with me here where really we pushed most of that RSP contribution into the following tax year yeah. because I had yeah. alternative minimum tax payable. Yeah. So yeah, some complicated tax issues where my accountant was a good help on this. Yeah. And and for those who don't understand this, uh, the lifetime capital gains exemption, which is sitting at, what's it at now? Like 900,000? Um, 913, 913, 630, I think. Yeah. yeah. It, it eventually it'll hit at the million stop. But um, the... That is not a savings necessarily in the first year because it triggers the alternative minimum tax. So you end up paying some tax on that. But that said, as long as you're earning income going forward at a reasonable level, you actually get that credit back. So it's um, you know usually over two years, roughly, depending on the situation. So you do get it, but you don't get it all up front. And that, that often kind of perturbs people. It's like, I thought this was tax-free. Well, it is mostly. Eventually. And then eventually. eventually yeah. We will yeah. basically do it. And that's, you know, that leads to some tax planning later on to realize, you know, for example, realizing investment gain returns or generating investment gain returns in order to utilize that, uh, that AMT amount, which, yeah. you know, can be tricky. And yes, they are very much talking about making AMT worse. Let's not go there. Not pleased about that. So yeah, it's, you know, as, as always, the <laughs> there's a difference between the theory and the practice, right? You know, I always think back to, I think it was, or which book it was, it may have been, it may have been uh, when Genius Failed, where when the one of the traders turned to the academic and said, yeah, you guys think you know a lot about trading this stuff, but you really have no idea how it works, right? <laughs> and it's, you know, in theory, it works a certain way in execution. Well, you know, the, you have to factor in a lot more that happens because we typically just summarize the, the, the top line without the difficulties. So excellent. So thanks for sharing your journey, Jason. Anything else you want to share about what this was like? I think that the other thing that I didn't mention here was, and you talked about it, finding a good buyer, but the due diligence process is a two-way street that mm-hmm. As much as you should be you know, going through and providing a lot of information about your business, you should be learning about the business that's acquiring you. And I think it's good to have discussions about uh, philosophy around things like employee um, hiring and firing, uh, discussions around strategic planning, discussions around investment into the business. I think those are all you know, big philosophical issues that a small business owner might take for granted that they have a certain perspective on and the acquirer might not have the the same perspective. So we had a lot of conversations about that kind of stuff in the acquisition. And I, I would really encourage people, and you you even mentioned it, there's sort of a sunk cost problem here where you think, well, we're kind of this far along in the deal. We can't turn it off now. But I think that you have to be prepared that the due diligence process reveals something about the buyer that might not make you comfortable as well. Yeah, and I will sum this up as that's just advice for any relationship, right? Like, and the reality is, is that unless you're a highly transactional business without any real relationship or intimacy to the consumer and you're not staying on and maybe your employees aren't staying on, the reality is, is that once that trigger is pulled, you staying on, your consumer, your customer staying on and your employees staying on, that new entity becomes the reality for those people. And all too often, I've seen cases where people have, basically, you know, sold to a company who did a bunch of stuff that they were not happy with or the things that were were against their principles or maybe took advantage of clients in a way that they didn't see fit or traded employees terribly. And in many cases, even, you know, where, where sellers left early because they didn't want to be there and leaving a bunch of money on the table. 
So any relationship is a two-way interview, quite honestly, even, you know, even, you know, even with my own practice, I always refer to our, our introductory meetings as look, this is a, this is a two-way interview. You're finding out what I'm doing. I'm finding out what you're looking for. And I'm, we're also finding out if we can work together. So yeah, you know, it's for, I know many people will often say, well, I just want to sell for the highest dollar. Many people will say that it sounds good in theory, in practice, just all this other baggage that comes with that, that you may not approve of. So I, actually had one case of an acquisition fall apart, largely because of the conduct and shenanigans, well, we'll call it shenanigans that we were seeing on the other side. It was like, you know what? Better off just staying on our own. So excellent. Yeah. Well, Jason, thank you so much for taking the time. Very much appreciated. Thanks so much, Jason. And I uh, always love your podcast. Thanks for doing the great work you're doing. <laughs> appreciate it. So that was today's episode of Financial Plan for Canadian Business Owners. I hope you enjoyed that. As you know, this is not a weekly series right now, simply because I'm having trouble finding content I haven't covered. If you have ideas for things that I have not covered, by all means, me, uh, reach out. But this will be still be coming out and rolling out. I have not quit. As always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please review on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever it is you get your podcast. And until next time, take care. This podcast was brought to you by Woodgate Financial, an award-winning financial planning firm catering to high net worth individuals, business owners, and their families. To learn more, go to woodgate.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify, or find more episodes at jasonperera.ca. You can even ask Surrey, Alexa, or Google Home to subscribe for you.